Well, this reading this morning um, rightfully blended three passages of Scripture. And we're going to look at our passage from John chapter 6. So if you do have a Bible, go ahead, open up to that chapter, the Gospel of John chapter 6. And this morning we're going to see how the Old Testament Scripture about Christ blends with and interacts with what we're going to see today. I trust that in the message, in our time, that you will hear from the Lord. I'm asking you to have an open mind, that you would have open ears, you would have an open heart, that the the Lord would continue to speak to us today. Now, as we're going through this book, it is helpful for us to remember the key passage. And if you go ahead and put it up on the screen. Now, these verses tell us why John has written this gospel. And so when we read the gospel of John, I want you to do so with this lens in mind, that you are looking for how the text reveals the identity of Jesus, who is the Christ, who is the Son of God, with the hope or the response of those who are reading that we would indeed realize who he is and then believe in him so that we may receive life in his name. This is John's lens, and this is how I'm asking us to read the scripture. And if you do it with this lens, you'll see what is there, and you'll understand correctly what the Holy Spirit will be speaking to us. So as we are memorizing this, let's say it together as a congregation. This is John 20, 31. So here we go. Why don't you read with me? These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Okay, So that is why John is writing this. And so far in the gospel, we see it time and time, over and over again, that John is, by the power of the Holy Spirit, revealing Jesus to all who would have ears, all that would have eyes, all that would listen to who this person is. And our passage this morning is no different than that. Now, as was mentioned, the feeding of the 5,000 was and is listed in all four Gospels. And if you have notes in front of you, which I provided, that are on the internet, it'll tell you the places in which this account is recorded. Now, it's interesting if you compare this, what is called the synoptic Gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, to John, there is a significant difference in the details that John gives and the details that are given in the other Gospels. Primarily, that John starts this account differently giving us details about the crowd, giving us details about the season or time of year. And then he, at the end of this passage, gives us more details about the response of the crowd. And so we have to pay attention to what John is bringing forward to us. And so I want us to look at this. Now we know then from the previous passage, right, as we look to it and think about it last week, where the religious leaders wanted to kill Christ. They wanted to get rid of him, not only because he, in their mind, disobeyed the Sabbath, the holy day, but primarily because he claimed equality with God. You remember this, right? And so they put him on trial. And we looked at this passage, Jesus' defense of himself, the witnesses that he brought forward from John the Baptist to his miracles to the word and his wonders. And so now John is saying, now that was one group of response, and yet even today those, there are those who want to destroy Christ or do not recognize that he is the Son of God. They may say he, see, see him as a prophet or a holy man or perhaps a moral teacher, but they don't recognize who he is and some want to destroy him, even in our day. Now in contrast to the religious leaders 
we see now this response of the crowd. Now, some wanted to kill him, but now the crowd wants to use Jesus for their selfish purposes. And so we're going to see some things about Christ this morning. We're going to see how he is greater, how he is better, and look at our, again our own hearts to understand what God would be saying to us. So John points out in the passage, this passage, that Jesus is the greater prophet and Jesus is the better king, which leaves us with a few questions, okay? Who do you say that Jesus is? What is your response to him? And why? Why do you follow him? Now, do you follow him because you know he's God's son who has the words of eternal life? And that's all the way at the end of this chapter where Jesus pours on and unpacks this, um, this miracle in a greater way. Do we understand that he is indeed the son of God who has the eternal words of life? Or do you and I seek him for what we desire and what we demand that he gives to us. Your understanding of who Jesus is and your motive in seeking or even following Jesus determines if you will finish your race well or if you will fall away. That is an important statement. If you receive life in his name or remain under judgment for your sins, this is right from scripture, this matters. Our motive matters. And John points us to this as we see the greatness of Christ. So again, let's open our Bibles, John chapter 6, and we're going to read and look through this account together. This is my first primary point. Jesus is the selfishly pursued. Jesus is the selfishly pursued. Let's read this, John 6, starting with verse 1. Now, after this, okay, after this confrontation with the Pharisees, after the healing at the pool of Bethesda, after that, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, got in a boat with his disciples, which is also called the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was <laughs> following him. This was the height of his popularity. People were looking for him all over the nation. Well, why were they looking for him? And John tells us, points this motive out, because they saw the signs that Jesus was doing on the sick. So they were following him because they saw the signs. He was healing people and they wanted to see this. They wanted to experience that. That was their motive, verse 3. Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. So again, we're going to pause here. This passage opens up with the motive of why so many people are following Jesus and the mindset of the people at that time. Or we're going to read that in just a second. Now, these two factors come in play at the end, okay, where how people respond to the sign Jesus gives them, okay? So keep that in mind. John wants us to remember why people are pursuing Jesus at this point in his ministry. Now, the first thing that John points out is again why the crowds were following Jesus. Why were they following him? Well, because they saw the signs he was doing on the sick. The crowds of people were not following him, were not following him because they thought he had the words of life and that they would receive life by believing in his name. They were not 
following him because they believed he was the son of God. They're following him for what he could do for them. They were not following him because they recognized again that he was the Christ, the son of God. Now they were following him because he had the power to heal them and to fix their pain. They followed him to improve their lives and have their current desires met and problems fixed. Does that sound familiar, right? People do this all the time. The crowds still do that even today. We'll call out to Jesus when we can't pay our bills. Or we'll call out to Jesus if our loved one is in the hospital. Or we'll call out to Jesus when we are afraid or we're in pain or we're in need. Again, if you've been around this country for a little amount of time, you understand when our country comes under times of crisis, the churches are typically full, right? But when things settle down a little bit and our needs are met or we're no longer so scared, it kind of dissipates. People will call out to Jesus in the back of an ambulance, right? Why do we do that? Because human nature, we acknowledge our need and then cry out to God. People in his day and people in every day just look to him to get their current needs met and no more. Jesus will come follow you again when I need something more. Have a nice day. And don't bother me because I got stuff to do. Right? You guys understand this mentality. So let's now continue to read as John is setting us up for what is to come. Verse 4 gives us another clue as to the mindset of the masses at this moment. Verse 4, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Passover. So if you are familiar with the Old Testament, you would realize what the Passover was. What the Passover actually is, was a recognition or celebration of God's deliverance of his people from the bondage in Egypt. As God delivered them through the prophet Moses, through signs and wonders, one of the things was that the angel of death would pass over the people who had the blood of the lamb foreshadowing over the doors of their home. And they were told, you must celebrate this year after year after year, recognizing my work among you, recognizing how I brought you from bondage into freedom. It is the celebration of their Independence Day, like our 4th of July, right? We celebrate 4th of July, we're celebrating freedom, we're celebrating those Brits took our tea and taxed us, right? We celebrate independence that day. So when you think about their mindsets, they were celebrating Passover, thinking of how God delivered them from bondage while they were presently in bondage to the Roman government, right? That would be like us celebrating July 4th, our freedom from the Britain nation, while there was an occupying nation over us, right? For instance, God forbid if Russia, let's take a country, overtook us, right? And could you imagine that if we were here celebrating July 4th when the Russians ruled America, right? That would be a problem, right? And so their mindset was thinking about their freedom, about God's deliverance and looking for someone to deliver them. This is why John puts it forward to understand the motives of the masses and also their mindset, what they were thinking about. So with that setup, in that time, Jesus specifically did this sign. Okay, And so this is our next point. Jesus is... The greater 
prophet. And this should make sense to you as we unpack this, okay? This was the sign that Jesus was giving through this miracle. Let's continue to read John chapter 6, starting with verse 5. Now, Jesus, lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, which was one of the disciples, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Now he said this to test Philip, for Jesus himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread, eight months of wages would not be enough for each of them to get even a little, to even have a bite. Let's just pause there for a second. By the way, when Jesus asks you and I a question, he's not looking for information, right? <laughs> he wasn't like, quick, Philip, get out your calculator and add up how much it'll take, right? When God called out to Adam and Eve in the garden, Adam, where are you? He wasn't, he didn't lose them, right? And he wasn't like, I can't seem to find you playing, you know, a supernatural hide and seek. He already knew where he was. Ask him a question so they would think about the answer, right? That's a test. When God asks you a question, again, he's not looking for information nor your input. He's wanting you and I to think about something. So he asked Philip, hey, Philip, if we're going to feed this mass of people here, how much money would that take? How could we do that? So it made Philip think, wait a second, it would be like, oh man, and how much money we have? And holy smoke, there is absolutely no way that we could feed these people. That's right, Philip, there is absolutely no way. You can feed these people, right? And so then he goes on. And so this is set up, and Philip is asking, there's like, there's no way that this can happen. And there was no natural way this could happen. Peter, now, excuse me, um, Philip is now in this mindset. Now, verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, actual people of that actual time, said to him, well, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? This is what we have, but it surely is not enough. So verse 10, Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in that place. So the men sat down. About 5,000 in number. Matthew says there's women and children there. So this was a massive crowd. Probably 10,000, maybe 15, even up to 20,000 People, a stadium full of folks walking to find him. In desperate need, some of them. Now Jesus then, verse 11, took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had taken their fill... He told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments and nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people, all right, so that's what happened. Now check this response, right? Now when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world? Now let's pause there, right? How would they come to that conclusion, right? Jesus did this miracle, right? The people knew that there's no way the disciples had trailers full and semis full of food in the back, right? Grassy place, no buildings. There is no place to store all this. And the people understood 
the sign. And then they concluded, surely this is the prophet that is coming into the world. This is the one that Moses told us would come. This is the one who performs the sign that Elijah did in the Old Testament. Now, we're going to read that passage that was read in portion for us this morning. So that we can understand the mindset of those who were there and concluded as they were comparing what was being uh, seen in front of their eyes with what they knew from growing up as good Jewish boys and girls. And they saw how these intersected. And we have to understand that in order to understand what John is telling us about the character of Jesus. This is 2 Kings chapter 4. Four. This is when a prophet named Elijah was ministering, and this is what took place with him in the Old Testament at that time. A man came from Baal Shalisha, bringing the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley and fresh ears of grain in a sack. And Elijah said, give to the men that they may eat. But his servant said, how can I set this before a hundred men? So he repeated, give them to the men that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left. So he set it before them. And they ate and had some left according to the word of the Lord. Are some things blowing up in your brain right now? I hope they are. Let me bring it to the surface a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to lay these passages side by side. First, if you go to the next side, we have Elijah the prophet. This might be, okay, you can read it. Elijah the prophet. And then in comparison to Jesus, the greater prophet. Okay, so we read in, this, in the Second Kings passage, next slide, a man brings 20 loaves of barley. Did you catch that? Now, what we read with Jesus, a boy brings five loaves of barley. Okay? A man bringing 20, a boy bringing five. There was a, perhaps in comparison a lot to work with, and there was a little to work with. Now, in the passage of Elijah, Elijah tells his servant to feed the crowd. And then in this passage, in John 6, Jesus asks his disciples to feed the crowd. Watch the connections. Now, in the Second Kings passage, Elijah's servant ask, asks, how can this be done? Right? In John 6, Jesus' disciples ask, how can this be done? Now, Elijah feeds 20 loaves to 100 men. This is why the men are singled out. In John 6, Jesus feeds 5 loaves to 100 groups of 50 men. If you read, by the way, in Luke, it says that he had the people, the men, sit down in groups of around 50. If you do the math, right, 50 times 100 equals how many? You guys have done math before. <laughs> do you see this comparison? This is why these details are pulled out. This is exactly why Jesus did what he did. Now, Elijah feeds them with Loaves and Jesus does one better. Jesus feeds them with loaves and with fish, yo. Elijah had some leftover. Jesus had abundantly more leftover. Elijah speaks the word of the Lord. Jesus is. The word of the Lord. The crowds understood the sign. 
They knew by heart the stories of these revered prophets of old. And when they saw Jesus and when they experienced and saw the details and understood, it went off in their mind, this must be the prophet. Oh no, he's not just a prophet. He is a greater prophet than Elijah ever was. He not just speaks the word of life, he is the word of life. This passage is not about bringing your little to Jesus and he will make it more. Okay. You've probably heard it preached that way. That's not what it's about. He didn't do it like this again, right? You didn't see Jesus out in the marketplace and people bringing up their lunch and like, hey, I have a party, could you do something, right? <laughs> That's not the point. I came to this point because we have to look again through the lens of Scripture. Why was this written? And if you understand then the Old Testament, why this was a sign. Well, there must be something a sign of in the Old Testament. Oh, my word, there's a passage that talks about this very thing. And oh, my word, look at all these parallels. And oh, my word, you see Jesus doing more with less. You see Jesus doing greater <laughs> with a little bit. You see Jesus proclaiming the word of God because he is the word of God. He is life. And this blows your mind, right? That Jesus is then indeed the Christ. Right? And that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. This is what this passage is about Jesus indeed was a prophet that was to come, but he is so much more than a prophet. This is what's being betrayed here. Not only is he the greater prophet, he is the better king. Right? Notice this response, right? They realize that he was... The prophet that was to come, they just experienced something. And then they came to this conclusion in their mindset again of the Passover. Their mindset of freedom that comes to them, that has come to them in the past. And the freedom they desired because of their national bondage. The people wanted to make Jesus the king by force. Verse 15, perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountainside by himself. No one makes Jesus do what they want Jesus to do. He only does what he sees his father doing. He made that abundantly clear. We don't come to him and force him to get what we want. For him to weigh the scepter of his kinship and give orders that will solve all our problems. We must come to him because he is life. Do you understand that? We can't force him to be our king so that he will do our will. We only recognize that he is the king and we honor him and love him for who he is. And then we look to do his Will. Do you understand this? Right. John was pointing to the motivation of the crowd, those who had just turned to Jesus to get what they want. 
And then as we see him walk on water next week, and as we see in the two following weeks, and you can read ahead, right? You'll see Jesus explain it and then ask them for something, and the people are like, yeah, I don't think so. This is going to cost me a little bit more than what I wanted to give, so goodbye, Jesus. Right? People do this all the time today. Some of your kids have probably done this. Some of you in this room have probably done this. Some of you probably right now are doing this. I'm here because I want Jesus to do something for me. Heal my grandma, fix my body, pay my bills, make me feel better. What if he doesn't? Well, then, fooey on Jesus, I'm going someplace else. And they walk away. And in this case, they were coming to Jesus to force him, mm, you're the leader we've been looking for, Jesus. You're going to be the one that throws out the Romans. By the way, there is no political Messiah, and stop looking for one. Stop it. That's already been tried, and the Messiah just walked away. Jesus understood what they were going to try to use him for, and they were going to force him because, man, he has some powers. Right? We don't need any weapons because Jesus can heal anybody. We don't need a supply train of food because Jesus can take care of that. Yeah. And this crowd was getting worked up. Jesus said to the disciples, get in the boat. You all go that way, and I'm going to go this way. Now here's something you're probably not going to like. But it's true that Jesus walks away from people that only want something from him and don't recognize that he's the king. He walks away. That's all you want me for? And he did miracles. <laughs> Here's the deal. Jesus did not come. His primary mission was not to fix your felt issues. To give you all that you want. He came to give you what you most desperately need. The greatest oppressor is not our government. Your greatest need is not for healing. Your greatest problem is not your bank account. The greatest oppressor of your life does not come from the outside, but it comes from the inside. It is sin. That's the greatest need. Sin is the greatest oppressor. He came to deliver us from what we really need because he is the better king. That's Jesus. He is the greater prophet. He is the better king. He's the suffering savior. He's the great deliverer of the worst oppressor that's known to humanity. Forgives us our sins, gives us a new heart, changes our desires so that we will follow him and honor him because when he comes back in his glory, no one's going to miss him. Right? And you don't make him king, you recognize that he is the king because no one makes people king. And a kingdom is not a democracy. 
He was born king. And you either recognize it or you do not. But your opinion doesn't change his identity. That's the point of this passage. So that we would recognize that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And then we have a decision to make. Will we follow him because he has the very words of life? And where else will we go? Right? You'll see this in John at the end. Read it. Where else will we go? You have the very words of life. Your motive matters in following Jesus. Like I said in the beginning, it matters whether you are faithful if you're following him because he has the words of life or if you fall away because you're only looking to get something from him. And when he doesn't deliver to you, it reveals your heart and you have to decide what you're going to do with this one called Jesus. Who do you say that he is. And again, I ask you this morning, why do you follow Jesus? Why do you follow him? Do you follow him because you love him? Do you follow him because you don't just welcome him, thank you Samaritans? Right? But you honor him. Like the Samaritan. Where are you at, Jack? He is the greater prophet. He is the better king. He's the king of kings. So respond. Love him. Serve him. Those that we read about, by the way, in Hebrews chapter 11, the heroes of our faith, they did not leave when the times got tough. Right? You understand that? What about our heroes of our faith? Were they just following Jesus because he made their tummies full? Right? Or did they follow him because he has the very words of life? I will follow you anywhere. You are the pearl of great price. You are the treasure in a thousand kingdoms. You're the bright and shining star. You are the one who has life eternal. I'm glad we sang Waymaker today. I was up here crying. Right? And I want us to respond, not just mentally, but emotionally, because we believe it. He is the greater one, and we surrender all. And so we are going to continue to walk through this. And I'm continuing to ask you this question. Why do you follow? Who is this man? Do you believe in him? Not just believe that he's a good teacher, but you believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God. My hope is that we would honor him more as a congregation. We would see him more of who he is. If you're a believer that your heart would be overflowing of praise and thankfulness to the one true king. And that if you are wondering and you haven't recognized who Jesus is, that you make your decision to follow him and put your faith in him. Him. And I want you to pray for those who have walked away, perhaps your children, perhaps your grandchildren, who only have the image of Jesus as the one to try to make their life better, and they've walked away because I tried Jesus, and my grandma still died. Right. Right. They were following a false Jesus. The real one is the King, the Lord, and does what is always right. So I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to transition with song and into communion. So here we are today, God, 
in a warm room today. Thank you that these folks are here. God, my prayer, as you know, has been that you would give us eyes to see what's in your scripture. That we would see what truly is being portrayed for us in this book of John. God, help us to understand what you're saying. Help us to realize who you are. Help us to surrender all because of love and devotion for you. God, forgive us for trying to make you do what we want you to do or else, Jesus. How dare we do that? God, forgive us of our self-centered pursuits of trying to force you to our will. God, help us again to realize that you indeed are the better king, you are the greater prophet, you are the Lord of lords. And when we pray to start out, hallowed be your name. May you be gloried and honored and lifted up regardless of our circumstances. And yet, you invite us to ask us for our daily bread. And you do indeed meet our need. We praise you in that. God, I ask that we would be a biblically informed congregation who take you at your word, who follow you because... (laughs) Who else would we go to? That we would love you and honor you and recognize that you are the bread of heaven. We pray, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and hallowed be your name. We turn recognize you, renew our faith, and give you praise, because you are the better king. In Jesus' name.